Right. We pick up today with uh, where we left off on Tuesday, looking at uh, religion and culture and history in the uh, 19th century, thinking about how um, a lot of that uh, that background is going to be important for thinking about some things that took place within the Restoration Movement in the latter part of the 19th century, specifically as we're thinking about some of the divisions that will take place. Uh, what originally started off as, an, as a unity movement um, is not able to maintain that, uh, that connection. And so, um, you know, it, uh, it, it starts to uh, break apart in the 19th century, and there are several things that are kind of the forces for that. And so we're looking uh, Tuesday and today at some of those things in general American history. And then uh, as we get the chance, uh, either today or next Tuesday, we'll start talking about how those things explicitly uh, appeared in the Restoration Movement uh, as it started to uh, splinter uh, uh, amongst the, the, uh, the different groups that are um, developing majorly the dis division that's taking place between the Churches of Christ and the Disciples of Christ. We left off talking about the Civil War and uh, some of the things that were taking place in the Civil War. Of course, the Civil War, like the Revolutionary War, a highly political event. But, especially with the Civil War, there was a lot of intertwining with um, the with the aspects of religion in uh, American culture that are important to recognize and here, even more so than what we have in the Revolutionary War, which wasn't as significant. Um, but you have religious people very interested in talking and thinking about the Civil War in the context of um, you know, thinking about who God is, thinking about uh, the morality of the nation, uh, several of those things related to, uh, you know, a national identity. So, uh, where we ended up uh, talking about um, the Civil War, particularly on Tuesday, was how both sides are thinking of themselves in, in the terms of, as Christians, and, and thinking about the Christian God being on their side. Um, which, of course, to us is, you know, we, we can't fathom how, how particularly the South would have uh, been able to claim God's support given, uh, you know, given the, uh, uh, the presence of slavery. But both Groups see themselves as Christians. Both are praying to God for success. Both believe that God is in support of their side and their position, um, even though we have two diametrically opposed uh, forces here, one that wants to preserve the union, one that wants to uh, divide it to protect the peculiar institution. So not only is the, are the origins of the Civil War shaped and, and wrapped in religious language, the Civil War itself, of course, is understood in religious terms. So that a lot of ministers and, uh, and others are, are using religious language uh, to talk about the, the war. Um, Mark Knoll is a prominent uh, American religious historian, teaches at Notre Dame, um, and he wrote a book a couple years ago called The, the Civil War is a Theological Crisis. Making, making the point of, of how much uh, theology was, was connected with the Civil War. You know, ministers and others are using scriptural language to describe their positions, they're using it to describe what's taking place in the war, um, and so the Bible, of course, provides a very important um, foundation for their thinking about reality to begin with, uh, maybe more so than what we have today. You know, that, that's um, scripture would have been foremost in their uh, thoughts, uh, in their speech, in a way that uh, <coughs> excuse me, in a way that it isn't today. Um, you know, even for Christians today, uh, we don't um, talk about um, we we don't pepper our our 
dialogue, unless we're talking about scriptural things or, or specifically religious things, we don't talk about them using scriptural language. That wasn't the case for a lot of 19th century people who would have known, especially the King James Bible. And uh, it would have just been common, uh, not just in the Restoration Movement, but in, in a, lot of, among a lot of people, uh, to incorporate phrases, concepts, um, you know, that were biblical in origin, and especially talking about something like the Civil War. And so we're talking about a country that is saturated with biblical language, uh, biblical culture. Um, you know, I, that's not a comment on, uh, you know, the, necessarily the religiosity of these people. Um, and not everyone that could use scripture in that way would necessarily have been orthodox in their beliefs. But it was just so, so much a part of the, the culture of the time that when you look at the sermons, when you look at the speeches, uh, you know, you, you can find it um, throughout that. And so the war uh, is, is no different when it comes to that particular issue. Um, often, as well, the Civil War was looked upon in, in, in the context of this uh, millennial expectation that the, uh, the millennium was either shortly to come through improvement or, as was becoming more the case, that the, the, the war was signaling the, the soon return of Christ, the premillennial position which would inaugurate the millennium. And when you think about um, the language that's used in something like uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, uh, the, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Uh, he is trampling out the vintage where his grapes of wrath are stored. He's loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Um, you know, the, there's, a, there's a way in which a lot of people saw this as a prelude to a new age. That this is uh, something distinct, different, is happening after this takes place and that going through this tribulation of, of the war is an important component of that. And this is prevalent even in the language that uh, Abraham Lincoln is using. So this is coming from the top down as well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of bottom-up here coming from the common people, the ministers, but also coming from the leaders of the nation. When you read Lincoln's second inaugural address, um, which is a very short uh, speech, one of the shortest inaugurations, um, very, it doesn't take you long to read, you can uh, Google it and find it very easily. Um, it almost is a sermon, <laughs> in a sense, a short sermon, uh, in a sense, and um, fits right in with how Lincoln is thinking a lot about this war, and, and especially the question of, for Lincoln, more so than perhaps some other people, is his uncertainty of what God is doing, but he is certain that God is doing something, and that God will be doing something in this war. Um, Essentially, this idea is mostly terms in, termed in context of providence. Lincoln, uh, there's a lot of questions about Lincoln's religious beliefs. A variety of denominations tried to claim him. Uh, there was even stories circulating uh, among the Restoration Movement churches shortly after Lincoln's death about a, I believe it's like a, a late night baptism or something like that uh, that takes place. It's unclear that, uh, that this had any um, accuracy. Um, there doesn't appear to be any truth to the, but it was a very popular story for a while. Just like uh, other groups claimed Lincoln in similar types of ways. But Lincoln himself, it doesn't appear that he was um, very strongly Christian in his outlook in that there's not too many references that Lincoln makes to Christ, uh, to any things connected with Christ. There, there are a few, but mostly he's talking about God in a very uh, general type of, type of sense. Um, 
wondering what God is doing in the Civil War, uh, what, what outcome God is going to bring about, um, what God can do, uh, you know, working through humans, because a lot of this is emphasized, a lot of things that, that uh, Lincoln emphasizes is, is the, the human responsibility in all of this. So, you know, even in, in Lincoln, you would have from the President of the United States uh, this discussion of the Civil War in terms of religion. And of course, that's, that's true even as the, uh, the Civil War ends, uh, as people think about you know, the aftermath, that those things in, are included as well. In the, uh, the time period after the Civil War, particularly in the South, you have this attempt by a lot of Christians to make sense of the war. And in so doing, they have developed what has often been referred to as the lost cause. Um, and particularly, some people have referred to it as the religion of the lost cause. And in many respects, it's important for us to see how this uh, religious ethos maintains itself, particularly in the South, in thinking about Southern identity and Christianity and Southern culture and the war. That in the face of defeat in the Civil War, Southerners attempted to make sense of what had happened, but also who they were. Okay. So this kind of something that they can hold on to that can overcome the history of the loss of the Civil War. And so you have this mixture of Southern identity, Christian language, and, um, and the sectionalism that is still prevalent in the post-Civil War period. We can see this, uh, some of this, in a uh, reflection of a, a sermon, uh, a comment from a sermon by uh, Melville Jackson in uh, 1887. Uh, and standing here this day, I charge the historian of these times that he shall not fail to tell to future ages that the southern soldier was a Christian warrior, and that he was brave, he was irresistible, because, he, because his faith uh, was in God and in the justice of his cause. I think that should be and that he was brave. Uh, he was irresistible because his faith was in God and in the justice of his cause. So, you know, a couple things that are prevalent in that uh, the statement. I mean, the, the southern soldiers were Christian soldiers, Christian warriors. Now, in a country where a large number of people uh, identify as Christian, uh, you know, in the 19th century, middle of the 19th century, okay, yeah, the, the southern soldiers, just like the northern soldiers, probably identified as Christian, if you'd ask them. But in what way was there, were they particularly Christian in their soldiering that was different, let's say, than the north? Well, you know, that's not necessarily something to be discussed. It is the idea that to be southern was to be Christian. Uh, and, and, there is an important way to think about that the, the people who died in the war died not just for a political conflict, but died as Christians. Uh, that they had very, these various characteristics and that they were able to identify, uh, they were, that these characteristics were identified because of their faith in God. And, and so the reason the soldiers, that the soldiers uh, should be honored, should be respected, uh, should be revered, is because of uh, the, the ideas that are, are shaped here with uh, the presence of uh, the Christian faith. When it comes to thinking about uh, the lost cause, there are a couple of different components that make up uh, the lost cause. First is um, you know, the, the idea of a variety of uh, Southern heroes, people like Robert E. Lee, uh, Stonewall Jackson, you know, these are individuals who were of the highest moral character in the Southern mind. Now, 
Uh, I don't want to uh, disparage that. And so I, I don't necessarily bring this up to suggest that this was not true. Um, we, from all, um, you know, all evidence appears to have been a um, very moral individual, uh, a good moral character, well respected on, on both sides of this conflict. But it is the way in which these individuals are talked about, right? the respect and the reverence that they are held in. Not so much the accuracy of, of that, uh, not so much to say that they weren't that. Um, I mean, even Lee appears to have been relatively anti-slavery, but only serves in the war because of his commitment to the state of Virginia. So, you know, Lee doesn't appear to be any sort of immoral individual, but he is probably elevated, we might say, you know, elevating these, these people to uh, something bigger than just um, what we might think of as uh, respecting veterans, uh, respecting those that uh, serve in, in conflicts. But there's something like this almost reverence for uh, people like Lee and Jackson and, and others. <clears throat> because these are the, uh, the highest moral examples. Uh, the, the highest moral um, people that should be espoused to. And so you get this kind of notion of, you know, the South as this moral, uh, orderly society that, uh, that produced these kind of individuals. Now, there's an idealism here. Um, while certainly there was a prevalence of Christianity, we can't ignore the amount of violence that existed in Southern culture to maintain um, that orderliness and to maintain that control. You know, to, to overlook that violence is to ignore what had happened to people that were enslaved, uh, people that were um, you know, in, held in bondage and, and some of the things that were done to them. Not just work, I mean, you know, there's the forced labor, obviously, but the, the beatings and the whippings and, and a variety of other things uh, where people could be killed at will and, and they would not be held uh, responsible for that. And then also the violence that existed between southern whites over things, right, that, that honor sometimes meant uh, attacking violently someone else, uh, some other white. Uh, so there's a lot of violence in the history of the South uh, that gets uh, you know, hidden behind these uh, great Southern heroes. And that's reflected in the, the myth of the Old South, that it's moonlight and magnolias. It's, it's, um, it's gone with the wind, it's honor, it's chivalry. And certainly there were some aspects of that, but there was also you know, a, a lot of uh, other things that uh, were not uh, accurate about that, the violence especially. With these kind of religion and the lost cause, there are also these notions of suffering and salvation. Um, you know, really kind of connecting this to, almost connecting it to the sufferings of Christ. That somehow the South's suffering is redemptive like Christ's suffering was. Um, and so this, this notion of connecting Jesus' death and suffering to the Confederacy becomes an important part of the thinking of, of people. And then finally, the notion that somehow the Christian, that the Confederates were more Christian than the Yankees were. Um, certainly in the North, by the mid-19th century, you see the development of more liberal forms of Christianity. Uh, that are less traditionally orthodox, that are certainly not things that forms of Christianity I would support or, or necessarily agree with. But, you know, the, the idea that somehow the, the South was, and the Southern soldiers were more Christian than the North and their soldiers is a judgment I don't think that has been properly vetted, right? I mean, how do you make that determination? And, uh, but, you know, it's just kind of this assumed, uh, assumed belief 
that this is the case um, without having any sort of um, specific evidence uh, in, in any sort of case. So, you know, the, the idea here is that the Confederates lost a holy war, that, that the best of Christian and Southern values was present in the Confederacy, and that these things, um, you know, the, that these things were not enough to win the war, but are an important way to think about uh, the South. And so, you know, this is, um, you know, pervasive throughout the South. I mean, it's, it's even still around today, uh, not as extensive as it was in those first several decades after the Civil War, but, uh, you know, it's, it's something that begins to permeate the South. And, and and really shapes a lot of Southern thinking about what it means to be a Southerner. The religion of the lost cause gets um, instantiated in the thinking and experience of the South in a couple of different ways. One way is through sermons by ministers, you know, where they would talk about these Southern heroes as saints or as martyrs. And so, first of all, you have the context of, you know, the sermon, right, a religious situation. And within that, you're using the religious language to talk about the South and, and, and these Southern heroes. And so that uh, facilitates this kind of conjoining of religion and the lost cause in the minds of Southern. In a variety of church buildings, you have uh, stained glass windows, uh, like those pictured there on the right, of uh, you know, kind of, I mean, stained glass, of course, in churches, um, but, you know, usually the stained glass, if it had any sort of representation, would be of holy figures, uh, any sort of figure, it, it, uh, human beings in the, in the glass. But you have these... Um, Pictures of uh, soldiers of Confederate heroes. Um, you know, this, uh, this, these over here on the right uh, being depictions of uh, Lee and the Confederacy. Uh, you know that there's this kind of conflation of biblical saints and Confederacy. These heroes in the stained glass, so to speak, in churches and in other places. There are a variety of sacred relics that uh, pop up. For example, the, uh, the Bible used by uh, Douglas, uh, not Douglas, um, Jefferson Davis was uh, kept under lock and key by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, you know, because not only is it the Bible, and so it's sacred because it's the Bible, it's sacred because it's Jefferson Davis's Bible. Um, there would be, you see the beginnings of these museums uh, where medals, flags, uniforms, weapons, are kind of put there uh, in, in not, it's not just um, a historical focus. There is that religious focus of these are relics, not just historical objects, right? With relics being holy objects. There would be uh, hymns sung in uh, at Confederate gatherings, some of which uh, were revisions. Uh, so, um, this one, uh, particularly, um, the, for example here, uh, of an additional verse um, of when the roll is called up yonder. On that mistless, lonely morning when the sage of Christ shall rise in a many mansion home to, to share, where our Lee and Jackson call us to their homes beyond the skies, when the roll is called up yonder, let's be there. Right, so this idea of, of Jackson and, and Lee are going to call people home. Um, so, you know, that's another part of, of this. Uh, the funerals of uh, soldiers, uh, were, you know, people dressed in their uniforms, they would, the bodies would be dressed in uniforms, guests would be dressed in uniforms, there would be military ceremonies for these people. Now, again, we're talking decades sometimes after the end of the Civil War. Uh, there was even the development of a uh, Confederate veteran's burial ritual, uh, where the, the veteran was looked upon as going to an honorable grave, grave um, that they had fought the good fight, 
Uh, and this, finally, this notion of the Confederates being a noble, virtuous people. Again, that's not to suggest that these soldiers weren't somehow virtuous, but you know, there's there's something extra being added here. And so, you know, this mindset of the South and, and what it means to be Southern. Um, a variety of memorial monuments and shrines. Uh, by 1914, there were over a thousand monuments. Um, battlefields were considered to be pilgrimage site, pilgrimage sites. There were statues with religious phrases, uh, like our causes with God, for example. Um, you know, you see the development of things that are specifically called shrines, more of a religious terminology, um, that are on battlefields or the graves of particular individuals. And so these rituals help institutionalize the lost cause in the mindset of uh, the South. So you have uh, groups like the United Confederate Veterans, the Sons of the Confederate Veterans, uh, using this notion of, of rhetoric that's very sacred, uh, reunions that would be held where uh, people would start with prayer. Uh, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, for example, would start their meetings with, we are gathered in the sight of God. Uh, churches also became a place for um, institutionalizing this, uh, of the, uh, the uh, lost cause. The, church, the God of the lost cause was the biblical God. Uh, church buildings would be used for observances, uh, memorials, uh, funerals, fundraising for monuments, and not just for religious activity, not just for Christian worship services. Even in the educational uh, system, Confederate veterans and their widows uh, dominated the school system, teaching Southern tradition, using uh, pro-Southern textbooks, of course the development of private religious academies uh, would have played into this as well. So you have this mindset in the South of, you know, that this was a, a religious endeavor, that the South is inherently religious, and that's evidenced by, um, you know, the, the people that were participants from the South in the Civil War. Really kind of setting up a sectionalism, a sectional identity uh, of this region. And, and that there's an antagonism here with uh, the North. As we move on into the latter part of the 19th century, there are a couple of things that develop that will be important for um, our, uh, our thinking about the Restoration Movement. We'll certainly talk about some of those previous things in the context of the Restoration Movement. But in the latter part of the 19th century, there are a couple of things taking place that will profoundly affect the United States and will profoundly affect religion in the United States as people begin to think about what does it mean to be an American. One aspect of this is the increase in urbanization. Prior to the Civil War, especially in the South, uh, culture was largely agrarian. And even in the North, there certainly were the development of larger cities. But in the post-war period, more and more people are flocking to cities because that's where they, they feel the jobs are. And certainly, you know, that is the, the case to some extent. Um, and, and so you have people uh, you know, moving to cities, the development of, of sizable cities and develop new, newer cities. With that is largely due, I mean, part of the reason for in, uh, urbanization is industrialization. The development of manufacturing jobs uh, is what leads people to the cities. With industrialization, of course, came a variety of additional consequences, um, the impact on the environment, etc. When in a culture that isn't as concerned about that as we might be today. Um, but the appeal of industrialization is to mass produce things, uh, it is to produce things uh, that hadn't been able to be produced before. And so that kind of effort in this time period needed a lot of workers. And so that leads to the migration of people. It's also leading to 
uh, you know, people to migrate throughout the country, uh, you know, going to these cities. Um, large numbers of African Americans, for example, will leave the South uh, and the agrarian system there, move to uh, the Midwest, particularly places like Detroit, uh, other urban industrial centers, Chicago, um, you know, to find work and with that hopefully find a better economic situation. But you also have the rise of immigration and a variety of different groups coming from uh, different places uh, in, in Europe predominantly. And as they come to the United States, they, uh, depending on the group and depending on the languages they use. So for example, the, you know, from the 1840s on, there's large numbers of Irish people that come to the United States. Speaking English, um, they have a little bit easier time assimilating. Certainly there are, there's a lot of um, stereotyping prejudice towards the Irish that takes place in the mid part of the 19th century, even sometime into the later part. But there was a little bit easier time than it would be for someone from Germany uh, or even in Italy um, who does not speak English or does not speak it as well. Um, also, depending upon why some of these groups left, um, you know, sizable numbers of Catholic immigrants come. And uh, so they're concerned about how Protestants are going to treat them. So you have a lot of these ethnic ghettos developed where people of the same ethnicity or nationality tend to group in a um, specific place, uh, specific parts of some of these towns. So this is where you get your, your German towns um, connected with some of your major cities, uh, sometimes your little Italy's. Um, later, of course, is when you get your uh, um, your Chinese quarters, uh, certain Jews based a lot of uh, that, that part, uh, Chinatown, that was the phrase I was looking for, Chinatowns, uh, that's kind of more into the 20th century, uh, although there's still some of it in the 19th. Uh, Jews often found themselves, uh, you know, either forced to or through their own choices live in some of these ethnic ghettos. So you have this theoretically what's theoretically a melting pot, but there's still a lot of division, hesitancy, uh, separation that, that's taking place in, in a lot of these places. With that, there is also a, a lot of fears. You know, people that are, are concerned uh, about a variety of issues. And so, there are people who are afraid of what modernization means. Particularly if they have a view of being agrarian, being closer to God. As a lot of people did. I mean, even Thomas Jefferson suggested the notion of you know, agrarianism kind of being human, human nature's natural state. Um, and so, as society modernizes, and this happens every time society modernizes, and sometimes appropriately, I mean, the, you know, there's certainly a lot of things that come with modernization uh, that can be problematic. You know, but in the 19th, late 19th century, there were great concerns about um, you know, what is taking place, um, especially as these, um, these, these modern developments in industrialization, urbanization, and some other things like that. Of course, with the rise of immigration, there are a lot of people coming to the United States, uh, people who come with different languages, different cultures, maybe even different modes of dress, uh, especially those first generation of immigrants. And so there's a lot of fear that people have about these immigrants, especially the concerns about are they going to take our jobs, um, you know, are they, and, and with that of course is the prejudices of, you know, people from this particular country are this particular way, uh, you know, they either can't be trusted or they're extremely violent or they are, you know, all sorts of things uh, that people invent about people from other countries. When you think about some of the things that, 
happened in the most recent election. And some of the comments that were made about people from Mexico, for example, um, and as, as well as people from um, Muslim-majority countries, uh, you know, there's this kind of stereotyping, and as immigration takes place, there is an increase in uh, people fearing the presence of people from other countries that they don't understand or don't know about. Additionally, in the latter part of the 19th century, more and more people turned away from religion as a means to understand reality. You know, believing that there were other realms, spheres of knowledge, there were other approaches, uh, there were other sci sciences, scientific information that uh, better defined or, or helped religion define what reality was. And that, of course, you know, led to a lot of people abandoning traditional religion, either turning to forms of non-traditional religion or, or turning to forms of agnosticism or skepticism. And, uh, you know, that would have been a, a concern for a lot of people uh, as, as well. But on the other hand, of course, industrialization led to the opportunity uh, for entrepreneurs and, and others to make uh, significant gains with respect to wealth. And so you see your people like your, your Carnegie's, your uh, Rockefellers, uh, all of these people that are presented as these heroic individuals who have made their way in the business world and have greatly uh, you know, succeeded in their wealth. And, you know, certainly that was the case where, you know, there's a lot of people who are um, making a lot of, uh, or, or amassing these um, sizable fortunes, but often they are doing it in, uh, in ways that perhaps we, we wouldn't necessarily support. It's also the time of capitalism really becoming a major force in the United States uh, economically. Uh, it had been present somewhat before, but the 19th century really brings uh, development. But it also brought with it some problems. You know, capitalism as a economic system um, seems to be one that makes a lot of sense and seems to be one that is in accord with a lot of biblical principles. However, capitalism um, can also be used by people, um, you know, so it's a tool like any other tool. It can be used positively or it can be used negatively depending upon uh, who's using it. And so for a lot of people to attack capitalism, the problem isn't capitalism, the problem is the sinfulness of human beings. Uh, and, and human beings who will exploit others for their own goals. And so at the time period, there is no minimum wage. And, and so there's not a concern on the part of employers to make sure that there are, their employees are making enough to live on. Um, you know, and, and so there's not that that governmental safety net, in a sense. And I, I know there's a lot of opposition to that, but, you know, in, in thinking about this, there's a very important question here that American Christians have been struggling with ever since, and that is, what, what responsibility do Christians have economically to the poor in society? What's, what responsibility does society have to act morally to those that are economically disadvantaged. And, and what are the best ways to achieve that? And so there's a lot of debate among Christians about this. Well, there's a lot of debate uh, among that, that time point, too. Uh, there were also you no know, labor laws, no child labor laws uh, at the time. And often people would send their children uh, to uh, work as soon as they could because of needing the finances to survive. Uh, which also meant that there weren't too many laws protecting 
uh, workers in general, um, so workers often found themselves in very hazardous conditions um, because you know, the focus was making money. This time period is often then referred to as the Gilded Age in, in the sense that uh, it was kind of like a gold covering over some of these horrors as well. Right? Immigrants being exploited, taken advantage of, um, yet you know, on the other hand you have these you know, people making huge uh, amounts of, of money uh, as well. And so the Gilded Age became a, a time period that was, um, you know, that had both of these concepts with it, both the success of people, you know, what you could achieve uh, capitalistically, but also the horrors um, morally of um, all of this. And so you have, you know, your big names uh, during this time really making a, a success. You know, and, and again, capitalism, when used, I don't want to say appropriately, but, but when used in certain ways, can lead to the success of a lot of people. And so the middle class grew because there were great opportunities. But when it is not used responsibly or not used uh, morally, it can also be problematic as well. So again, it's a tool. And a lot of it depends on the people using the tool and whether they are moral or not. But it wasn't just a challenge to society. And it wasn't just a challenge, it wasn't just a development in politics or, or culture or something like that. But you also see a variety of things taking place growing out of this that also had an important impact on religion. One of those is what's known as biblical criticism or higher criticism. We talked about the Renaissance, and one of the things we emphasized, mentioned in the Renaissance, was the development of textual criticism. Textual criticism referred to the idea of comparing manuscripts of the same document, or the same text, right, multiple copies of the book of, book of Matthew, for example. Comparing them and noting if there were any sort of discrepancies, which again, you know, biblically there are some differences, some of which are, most of which are insignificant. They don't make that big of a deal. But when you look at these differences, the question becomes which was the original text? And if you have two different words, which word was originally used? So when you have these cases of uh, prayer and fasting, for example, this seems to be one that, that's fairly common. Uh, some texts would just have prayer. Some others would say prayer and fasting for the same verse. So which was it? When Matthew originally wrote this, this document, did he write prayer or did he write prayer and fasting? So textual criticism involves comparing the manuscripts, making decisions based upon uh, a variety of criteria um, to determine whether or not, or, or what the uh, what the appropriate reading was, and so that developed uh, in the Renaissance period, and, and you know continued up through the time. But in the 19th century, uh, a school of thought developed in Germany that essentially applied evolutionary principles to the biblical text. The reasoning went sort of like this. If human beings evolved from other forms of life, and so if we are, if, if we and apes had a common ancestor, as gets postulated by Darwin, I'll talk about Darwin here in a minute, then as we evolved into the species Homo sapiens, and then as Homo sapiens evolved from lower forms of culture to higher forms of culture, our culture must have evolved as well, which must mean that the Bible evolved as well. So essentially, you know, I mean, a lot of this is based on 
uh, an acceptance of evolution to begin with. And so if you don't accept evolution, then, you know, I mean, that's, that's a different story. But we're talking about people who believed that uh, evolution had taken place. So, if the Bible evolved as a document, these people believe, were there, was there not evidence that could be determined that would demonstrate that the Bible evolved? And so these German theologians began to question how the text of the Bible uh, developed. One particular area where that really started first was in the question of the Pentateuch, the books of Moses. And in examining the books of Moses, some German thinkers claimed that they found evidence that the books of Moses, which had traditionally been identified as the product of Moses, that Moses had written them, um, that there was evidence they felt that those books had been constructed over time out of multiple sources. That as these sources were developed, they were stitched together into what became known as the Pentateuch. This was based on a variety of things like the different names for God, Sometimes God being referred to Yahweh, sometimes God simply being referred to as God, uh, a different Hebrew word, um, cases where uh, there appear to be a retelling of the same story, but with slightly different details, uh, apparent paradoxes, beliefs that uh, different texts or different parts of texts were presenting different theolo theologies, um, texts that favored the northern kingdom versus the southern kingdom later on in the history of the Israelites, or the opposite, favored the southern kingdom over the northern kingdom, or the northern kingdom over the southern kingdom. And so there was this belief that they could determine how these different documents had developed over time and what material came from these different sources. Now it's important to note, and we don't have the time to talk about all of this, uh, it's important to note that none of those supposed original sources has been ever found. There is no manuscript that has been found that is the supposed source that was added to these other sources. So there's no archaeological or manuscript evidence of this beyond again, those kind of things that they pointed to. Yes, there are different names for God here. Um, yes, there are places that appear to tell the same story in slightly different ways. You look at you look at Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two, and there are a lot of places where you can say, well, this doesn't seem to be. I mean, they both seem to be talking about creation, but they seem to be presenting different views of creation. Um, there are other places like that. You know, the naming of, of the town of Beersheba, for example, and there appear to be two different stories as to how Beersheba got its name. In most of those cases, <coughs> just to talk about the creation story, there are, I think, legitimate explanations for the differences. So that when you look at the creation of human beings in Genesis chapter 1 and the creation of human beings in Genesis chapter 2, I think they are referring to the same event. I think they're coming from the same author. It's their different views of the same thing. And the Genesis chapter 1 is giving this large overview, what we might call the 10,000 foot level of the creation. And going through and just kind of giving you in 31 verses the six days of creation. But chapter two is more of a lower level focused attention to the origins of human beings and how God worked that out. So one's a 10,000 foot level, one's a, a lower level of a specific part of that. That God is inspiring Moses to focus on this particular event because it is so important for who God is, what human beings are, uh, etc. But again, you know, this was 
biblical criticism as it develops becomes problematic for a lot of people because they, they're accepting these ideas, and if you accept that the Pentateuch was not the composition mostly of Moses, um, but was instead the product over several hundred years of different authors, what does that do to inspiration? What does that do to the historicity and the accuracy of the Bible? And eventually people would move on to other texts, not just the books of Moses. And so it becomes a, a problem for uh, English theologians and then American theologians. Um, and so eventually some Protestants, including, I mean, this will be one of the issues we bring up with the Restoration Movement, um, accept these ideas of higher criticism, and believe that this is what's taking place, and uh, it will lead them to a variety of more liberal theologies, while others will, of course, be very hesitant to accept those ideas, and will actually call them into question. Science, of course, brings uh, its own set of challenges with the development of geology, with the um, with development of the fields of astronomy, um, develop, you know, coming up with the scientific uh, ideas, theories, developments, um, hypotheses, etc. That question the age of the Earth. That question the uh, the development of human species. And all of that, of course, has a significant challenge to religion as well. Um, and, and when you think about this, um, you know, with the development of Darwinism, and specifically Darwin's theory of natural selection as explaining human evolution. Like, there have been ideas about human evolution prior to Darwin. It wasn't like it suddenly appeared. But he specifically develops a way to think about how it took place. Uh, that those animals that were better suited to a particular environment because of their genetic code were the ones that survived and reproduced. And so with mutations and other things that, that took place, uh, you know, he wouldn't have necessarily thought about mutations, but essentially some species, some expressions uh, of, of nature were better suited to serve some environments, and so they survived while others did not. And so over billions of years, millions of years, nature randomly selected, okay, unconsciously, you know, not intentionally, um, certain developments to continue, certain not. Uh, and that's why you saw such a divergence in, in species. There's, to some extent, that, that notion, I think, makes sense scientifically, but that it would explain the entirety of life, or even, you know, I mean, because that makes sense that certain individual animals or certain types of animals would be more fit for a specific um, situation, and those would be the ones that survive. Um, but when you back it with, this is how, you know, birds evolved from lizards, or humans and apes evolved from a common ancestor, that's where I think, well, you're going too far. Um, but, you know, how we, well, how we see such a divergence in, like, um, different types of animals, different types of species, uh, different types of plants, you know, that, that makes sense, but we're not, in that sense, it's not talking about, like, you know, animals becoming other animals. Uh, we're talking about, you know, species becoming other species. We're talking about variation within kind, not, um, you know, moving from one kind to another. Anyway, this being far afield of the point. The point is that <laughs> this is a great challenge to the identity of human beings. First of all, all these challenges about the age of the earth and where human beings came from contradict a plain, rather literal reading of scripture. 
So, for a lot of Christians in the 19th century, in, in Europe and in the United States, they are faced with a choice. Do they hold to a traditional view of the Bible, or do they abandon their religion as, as erroneous, as, uh, as misleading, as mythical, or do they try to find some sort of intermediate state where they can hold on to some aspects of the Bible while also bringing in some ideas from science? And again, you have this kind of split that takes place with some more conservative Protestants especially saying, you know, that I don't believe that this is taking place. I don't believe this explains life. I, I believe in a traditional reading of the Bible. And then you have more liberal Protestants who will say there's some sort of there's some sort of commonality here, there, or there's some sort of way in which we reinterpret how we've understood the Bible in order to make it accommodate the start sermons. And so this is happening on a grand scale in Protestantism. But it is also happening on a limited scale in um, the Restoration Movement. So the same things that are going on in Protestantism in general are appearing in the Restoration Movement. And some of the cracks that had already taken place because of the Civil War, because of the Missionary Society, because of uh, the Reform Movements, all of those are kind of the liberal theology really begins to split these fissures uh, wide open. Uh, and we'll talk more about that uh, next week. Uh, that optimism in humanity, uh, that post-millennialism, that uh, human beings are going to inaugurate the kingdom of God and then Jesus will return after a thousand year reign. Not after, after a thousand years of peace and prosperity, Jesus will return. Um, the Civil War, other wars throughout the 19th century, other types of developments really damage the post-millennial outlook. It just does not seem uh, to, to be something that uh, reflects where human society is going. In fact, it's kind of too many people going the other way. And, uh, and so a lot of people abandon the post-millennial outlook and uh, a lot of people develop a premillennial outlook, meaning that human beings are just so evil that the only thing that's going to change society is the return of Christ. And then, when Christ returns, that is going to inaugurate this, uh, this time of great peace and, and prosperity. Another challenge, and coming from within religion itself, is uh, the development of the social gospel. Uh, the social gospel essentially was an attempt by some predominantly liberal Protestants to try and address the difficulties and the challenges that existed for the, the poor and the oppressed in society. Right? So you have the growing difficulties of the immigrants coming in, you have the lower class in these urban areas, and so there are these Christians who become convinced uh, concerned and then convinced they need to be doing something uh, about this. Um, and, and so, predominantly, there appears to be you know, uh, this development of applying Christianity to social justice issues. And so, they step out to try and address the, um, the conditions, the working conditions, uh, the way the rich are taking advantage of the poor. Um, and so, through the latter part of the 19th century into the 20th century, there's this much more socially focused Christianity. Often, that socially focused Christianity was of the liberal variety, meaning that the focus was on um, you know, social salvation and less so about individual salvation. And it was about uh, you know, the transformation of society and less about individual conversion. And so you have this development predominantly within liberal Protestantism. Now, obviously, we've seen previous to this that in the early part of the 19th century, um, 
a lot of people, Protestants, Evangelicals, Catholics as well, but you know, Catholics aren't there as is largely in numbers. Um, this idea that true Christianity is lived out Christianity. But that interesting reform that a lot of people had was still very closely connected to the notion of individual conversion. Not so with the social gospel. With the social gospel, it was much more about this kind of collective transformation. And so, in many respects, with the development of the social gospel, because of its connection to liberal theology, like higher criticism, like the acceptance of Darwinism, a lot of conservatives kind of backed away from being socially active because social justice, social activity was often conflated with liberal theology. And so any sort of liberal theology, liberal outgrowth, uh, was often seen as, um, you know, this, this is not something that, as a conservative, not that they would use the term conservative, um, but that somebody is, is committed uh, Christian, I can't be involved in. Uh, and so this idea of uh, the social gospel uh, is appealing to liberal Christians, but not as appealing to conservative Christians. And so once again, you see this divide happening in a, um, in a large sense in Protestant Christianity that will also be reflected in a smaller sense in the American Restoration. I turn now to talk about some of those particular issues uh, and seeing them as reflected in the, uh, the restoration movement and, and thinking about some of the things that we've been looking at over the past uh, two days and, and seeing them as being um, a part of the experience of um, people in the restoration movement as well. Let's start off kind of with the, uh, the Civil War and the period leading up to the Civil War, uh, disciples were slaveholders. Um, not all disciples, but there were slaveholders that were members of the Restoration Movement, both the Disciples of Christ and the Christian Movement out of the Stone Movement. It's estimated that, to use the term disciples to refer to this entirely, that uh, the disciples held about 101,000 slaves. Now, that's, I mean, they're, they're about I believe it's uh, 4 million slaves. I think it's 4 million slaves. It might be 12 million. But we're talking millions of slaves in the South. And so the number might not seem uh, that great. Oh, I mean, obviously if you were enslaved and these were one of your slave offers, that'd be one thing. Um, but as far as like proportionally, that doesn't seem to be that great of a number. Uh, and it's understandably so, but when we think about the different religious groups that are present in the South at the time, only Baptists and Methodists held more slaves than those of the Disciples of Christ in the Christian movement. Predominantly Disciples of Christ, because Christians, most of them were anti-slavery. Excuse me. Some scholars have said, though, when you break it down per capita, what the, when you compare the size of the disciples to some of these other groups, that the disciples held more slaves per capita than other religious groups. Um, so we're still talking about, you know, the restoration movement was involved in slavery to a sizable extent in the South, just like other uh, religious groups were. There were some slave members in churches, uh, as other groups had. There weren't too many churches that were specifically uh, African American churches, like what you see in the Baptist Church and the Methodist Church, these congregations developing of slaves um, and, and slave preachers. There were a few uh, of that among the disciples and the Christians, um, but uh, not as extensive as what you see with uh, some of these other groups. Um, Baptists and Methodists were also more active in converting slaves, going out and preaching to them, trying to get people, trying to get those slaves to convert. Uh, 
um, to Christianity, particularly Baptist or, or Methodist, uh, doesn't appear to have been as much an effort by the disciples. The disciples, of course, were certainly um, out converting people, um, but they didn't seem to be as interested in sending missions to slaves like uh, some of these other groups would have. Uh, certainly, there, within the Restoration Movement groups, there were others different. Many who were part of the King Ridge Church, back under Barton W. Stone, uh, many of those uh, released their slaves uh, after the revival, right? after the King Ridge Revival in 1801. Um, a sizable group of those people, while they were still Presbyterians, are motivated to release their slaves. Um, Stone, of course, as we talked about, had supported colonization. At first, when he saw that wasn't going to be successful, he supported abolition, total abolition. Uh, we also mentioned about how he freed uh, his own slaves. Most of the preachers coming from the Stone wing uh, tended to be anti-slavery. Uh, some of them were very active in um, abolitionism. Um, there were some that favored more of a gradual emancipation uh, that would, event, would also involve compensation of slaveholders for the loss, uh, the economic loss of the labor of those they had enslaved. Um, but it seems like the, the Christian wing, more than the disciples wing, uh, was, was more active anti-slavery. But both Campbells, both Thomas and Alexander Campbell, were anti-slavery. Uh, Thomas had started a school in Kentucky, which he had closed after being reprimanded for teaching a group of, of African Americans. And so because he taught African Americans, he kind of, you know, he gets condemned for it, and so he just decides, well, I'm closing this school, and he moves back to Pennsylvania, uh, actually, trying to get away from this. Uh, Alexander Campbell, we talked about how he did end up with a few slaves, it's two or three, um, you know, which, of course, is still important for those particular individuals. But compared to other slaveholders, this is rather minor uh, slaveholding. Uh, but once they were old enough that they could take care of themselves, uh, he does free those slaves that he does uh, inherit. In the Christian Baptist, uh, he did condemn uh, the splitting of slave families. You know, but ultimately he's not too active in the Christian Baptist period, 1823 to 1830. There's not too much of discussion that he makes about slavery. The only comments appear to be about this idea of, you know, slaves would off, uh, slaveholders would often uh, split families apart, sell the wife uh, to one family and keep the husband, or, or do the opposite, or you know, sell the kids away from the parents. Uh, and so Campbell was. Uh, you know, vocal uh, in opposition to that. When he starts the millennial harbinger, however, uh, he is much more vocal uh, against uh, slavery, wanting to see emancipation, but a gradual emancipation. Um, he also sees the millennial harbinger as participating in this process of emancipation. And, and so he, he talks about that uh, he's going to deal with issues to help prepare for the emancipation and the exaltation of the degraded condition of the American slave, or of African slaves. And so it, it does appear more of an interest in his uh, writings from 1830 on. Um, he condemned laws uh, against teaching slaves. Education, of course, very important for Campbell, uh, feeling that everyone should be educated. <coughs> Uh, in the years 1829 and 1830, Virginia was reviewing its constitution, its state constitution, and wanting to come up with a uh, revised constitution, as a lot of states were during that time. Campbell participated on that, one of the few political things that Campbell actually got involved in. And uh, one of the things he wants to push for is for a, um, a gradual emancipation plan. So he's got this gradual emancipation plan he wants to promote, which would use the governmental surplus to pay owners and, you know, particularly at the time he's thinking colonization. And so he feels the government has the money that they could pay the owners for the lost uh, economic input, as well as help Africans go back to Africa. 
although in a bunch of time, a lot of African slaves, uh, African American slaves, have been born in the United States. They're not from Africa, uh, other than, you know, genealogically. So both uh, Kimberholz and Stone uh, were against slavery, um, but on the other hand, uh, Alexander was also against extreme abolitionism. Uh, you know that, that he did not support those abolitionists who were very radical. Um, he would not go so far as to say that slavery was always the same. Um, he also uh, was concerned because a lot of northern disciples were very involved in the, in the abolition movement. But he doesn't want to divide this movement that is just in the infancy of uniting together. So you have Southerners and Northerners, and there's kind of this this tension that's developing. And so he's trying to keep this these uh, these groups together. And so he wants to find a moderate position that everybody within the movement can compromise on, and that would be something uh, that would be um, you know, he feels that would be the the best thing for the movement, instead of taking the abolitionist or the secessionist uh, support of slavery uh, and, and taking that, you know, kind of like he can't, he can't go either direction, he wants something in the middle. We'll pick up on Tuesday uh, with more about this and some other issues that were facing the movement that led to the division between the Churches of Christ and the Disciples of Christ. So we'll pick up with that on Tuesday.